Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Petizano and I am the Atomic Absorption Microwave Plasma Product Manager at Agilent Technologies. I am joined today by Jenny Nelson and Yan Chung, who have over 25 years experience in the petrochemical industry, working in various oil companies. They are also the energy and chemical specialists at Agilent. Thank you for joining today as we have some great news on a new ASDM method for the elemental analysis of crude oil and residual fuel. Firstly, I would like to introduce to you the Agilent 4210 MPAES, elemental analysis that runs on air. It's simple, proven, and efficient. Microwave plasma atomic emission spectroscopy is a novel atomic emission spectroscopy technique. The MPAES journey starts back in 2004 and 2006 with our first patents being released. In November of 2011, Agilent released the first commercially available microwave plasma system, the 4100 MPAES. In January of 2014, the second generation instrument, the 4200 MPAES, was released featuring new innovations, including a new waveguide and torch and new firmware and software. In September 2016, the latest version was released, the 4210 MPAES, which could be now fitted with a number of new accessories, including the integrated AVS4 valve and the ISOMIS temperature-controlled spray chamber. There were also new consumables released, the OneNeb Series 2 and the Inert Torch. An update in March of 2018 um, brought with it a new waveguide kit and a new software version now with Windows 10 support. It also added in a number of instrument tests designed to allow users to do a health check and monitor performance of their instrument to give information about problems so they can be fixed by the user. Our most recent news is in June of 2020 with the release of a new ASTM standard test method, the ASTM D8322, for crude oil and residual fuel oils. It's a simple dilute and shoot method for nickel, iron, vanadium, sulfur, and more. And we have more information to share throughout this presentation. Microwave plasma emission follows a very similar path to that of other optical emission spectroscopy techniques like ICP OES. A sample is presented to the instrument via a sample introduction system through a torch containing a plasma. The plasma in an MPAES is made up from nitrogen that has a temperature of 5,000 degrees Kelvin, which is hotter than that of flame atomic absorption. This allows for better performance. Samples are desolvated, atomized and excited in the plasma to produce light emissions at atomic specific wavelengths. The light then enters the monochromator and detector where they can be quantified within the instrument software. So how does the MP work? The 4210 MPAES uses nitrogen extracted from air using the Agilent 4107 nitrogen generator. The microwave saw is the heart of the technology and the image shows the interaction of the magnetic and electric fields from a magnetron that are focused into an iris to sustain a toroidal nitrogen plasma. The torch is vertically orientated and offers a stable introduction of aerosol samples through a classical, easy to use sample introduction system, similar to that of an ICP OES. The aerosols that are presented to the torch contain elements that when they're excited, produce emissions of light. These light emissions are viewed axially from the end of the plasma and directed into the fast scanning monochromatic optics. The emissions are channeled along the path of the monochromatic where they are separated into the wavelength of interest. The atomic specific wavelengths are measured by a high efficiency CCD detector where they can be measured and quantified against intensities of known concentration that form a calibration. The 4210 MPAS has notable features 
the benefit elemental analysis requirements. It has a low cost of ownership. Nitrogen used in the MPAES is cheaper than acetylene or argon, and it becomes even cheaper when you are generating nitrogen from air. This also eliminates ongoing gas supply costs. The MPAES also doesn't require hollow cathode lamps or a chiller. It has better performance with lower detection limits and a larger dynamic range than flame atomic absorption. It is safe to operate with no flammable gases and no manual cylinder handling. And it's easy to use. The intuitive MP expert software can be operated by users with minimal training, and the sample introduction is easy plug and play design. The 4210 MPAES offers significant safety improvements over other techniques. The nitrogen plasma eliminates the flammable gases of atomic absorption, which is really important in petrochemical laboratories that have lots of flammable chemicals in them. The microwave plasma also allows for unattended analysis. The second safety advantage is around personnel and operator safety. By using the 4107 nitrogen generator, it completely removes the handling of compressed gas cylinders. It also eliminates the need for ongoing gas supply. And this is advantageous at remote locations where it can be difficult to get in acetylene or argon. The standard sample introduction is simple and robust. The 4210 comes with the 1NEB2, a high efficiency inert nebulizer. It also comes with a double pass spray chamber for effective fine aerosol transfer to the plasma and an easy fit one piece torch. The sample introduction has been designed for ease of use in mind. The easy fit torch is easily handled and can be loaded in three simple steps. Firstly, open the torch loader. Second, insert the torch. And third, close the torch loader handle. The torch is automatically aligned and all gas connections are automatically connected. No further operator interaction is required. The spray chamber and nebulizer are simply clamped and locked, and the quick fit fittings connect the tubing in place. Agilent offers a range of accessories to optimize performance. For the petrochemical industry, we have the external gas control module, or the EGCM, which allows for air injection into the plasma to prevent carbon buildup when running organic samples. It also facilitates controlled purging of the optics for low UV analysis, including sulfur, and is easily controlled through the MP Expert software. The SPS4 is a fast, versatile, high capacity auto sampler and is compatible with the MPAES as well as the other Agilent Atomic Spectroscopy products, including Atomic Absorption, ICP OES, and ICP MS. The MP Expert software is simple to use with an intuitive workflow, guiding the operator through the analysis steps. It features auto background correction, removing the need for users to place the background markers. It is flexible with a detailed system dashboard and has the option for online remote operation with the automation software pack. It also has powerful reporting tools. The MP Expert software has been designed to be user friendly with an easy to follow workflow taking the user through all the steps leading to analysis. The instrument controls are all at the top of the screen. And in the same window, we can see the results, replicate data, emission spectrum, and calibration. MP Expert also features applet mode for the simplest steps to sample analysis in three easy clicks. You simply need to select the applet icon from the desktop to load a method, light the plasma, enter the sample labels, and press run. 
I will now pass over to Jenny, who will give you more details about our exciting new ASTM D8322. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. So today I would like to talk to you about our ASTM method D8322-20, uh, and this is the standard test method for determination of elements in residual fuels and crude oils by microwave plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. You can see in the picture the method on the ASTM website. It is now available for you to go check out and download. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background on how this method started. So it was probably about six years ago in about 2014 that I was working with our collaborators at Chevron and we were talking about this new wonderful technology that Agilent came out with, the MTAES. And they were very interested in learning more about it and maybe doing a study to see, you know, how well this instrument could perform with their very difficult samples. So we decided to work with crude oils first and we ran, you know, the gamut of crude oils. We had a huge range with all different crude oils having different APIs and we really put this thing to the test. And they were very impressed with the uh, results that the MP MPAES could give. So we published this paper in Energy and Fuels. After we published this paper, we published an Agilent application note based on that work so that everybody would have access to it, because we know not everybody has access to all published peer reviewed journals. After that study was complete, we decided let's try some even more difficult samples. And so we decided to try some petroleum fractions, uh, heavier fractions that were 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit and higher. So we ran these on the MPAES as well, and we had great results again, and we published this again in Energy and Fuels in 2017. We followed this method, again, with an Agilent application note so everybody would have access to the study that we did. And after we completed these two studies, we decided that this would be a really great um, instrument and method for the petroleum industry. This instrument, like we've already stated, or Daniel already stated, is uh, suited very well to be um, in remote locations because it doesn't require argon. So Chevron is a company that has a lot of satellite labs and satellite facilities. Um, in remote locations, and so, you know, maybe this would be a good alternative um, instrument for them. So, we um, did a lot of work, and I'll share that with you soon, um, but we were able to get this final method. So, now there is an ASTM method using the MPAES uh, for the determination of elements in residual fuels and crude oils, and that was all based off of the preliminary work that we did in those two energy and uh, energy um, in fuels papers that I just showed you. So a lot of people um, know that we have a ASTM method, but aren't quite aware of the years of work that went into this method um, before we even started this ASTM method. So that was just a little bit of background and definitely have to thank our collaborators at Chevron for, um, for all their hard work doing this as well. Okay, so here is the timeline for um, the ASTM D8322. So I find it very interesting how long some of these test methods uh, take to get approved, but it's, a, it's quite a lot of work for the people that are involved. So kudos to all the people that work on ASTM methods. So we originally started this project again after we published that second paper in Energy and Fuels, and we had this um, project approved by um, our managers so that we could try to get this uh, method, you know, developed and proposed to ASTM. So that was the first step and that happened in, you can see, spring of 2017. That was the first step. The second step is that we had a proposal to ASTM in October of 2017. We started to work with two collaborators. Um, they were the Chevron, who we worked with before, and Enrol, who was another collaborator for um, our biofuel version of uh, an MPAES method. So we had the work item um, you can see right here, which was work item 56841, which was for standard test method for determination of metals in crude oil and residual fuel oils. 
Okay. And then in December of 2017, ASTM denied our balloting with this method. Um, and the reason for that was that this was brand new technology. There wasn't a single method in ASTM that used our microwave plasma atomic emission spectrometer. And so this was a new for everybody. It wasn't an ICP OES, an ICP MS, something that they'd seen before, or a GC, which is tons of methods with GC and other, you know, instrumentation. So we had to do um, more work. And so in January of 2018, we decided to work with an ASTM a statistical expert so that we could run a pilot study. And this was before running an interlaboratory study. So the next thing was that in July 2018, we started uh, or we finished our um, pilot study. This pilot study uh, was working with six laboratories. The six laboratories that we worked with were um, Agilent, um, and in Santa Clara, and then we worked with Chevron, which is in Richmond, California, up the road, and we worked with Enrol, which is in Colorado, and uh, BV in Texas, and Wake Forest University in um, Georgia, and then we worked with um, SGS in the Netherlands, and we got some really good results from the different laboratories. So the next thing we did is work on our ILS. So this is where we had multiple labs all over the globe running this method. And most of these laboratories, with the exception of, you know, the Agilent Labs and uh, Wake Forest, none of these laboratories had ever run, or some of them had never even heard of an MPAES before. So this was quite a feat to be able to place instruments all over the globe train these folks and get them to participate in this ILS. And so you can see we now have the addition of an additional Agilent lab, and we added um, a university um, in San Carlos in Spain, and Total uh, in France, and Nestle in Finland, and SGS in Saudi Arabia. And we also added another Agilent lab in Melbourne, Australia. So you can see we really cover the globe. And it, again, it was a lot of hard work. And I know because I traveled to the majority of these places and worked with these folks, but it was a really uh, great experience. And I was very happy when all the labs had turned in their data and we had really good results. So the next step was that all the data was compiled by the ASTM statistician. And in May 19, in May 2019, we had a standard ballot with the subcommittee. And then we had our final method, our ASTM method, D8322, finally finalized in June 2020. So you can see that this just brings a smile to my face because I started working on this project probably back in uh, 2014. So I'm very happy now to see that the ASTM has accepted the MPAES method. Okay, so I just wanted to share with you a few results from the ILS. Um, I think that if you really want to know more about this method, the best thing to do is to reach out to me uh, individually, or if you'd like to get the method from ASTM, that's a great idea as well. Okay, one thing that I want to point out to you is that the crude oil and fuel oil is all run in the same method. So you can run both uh, sample types within the same method, and you can see how we set up the uh, method here. So this is a method sequence. Let me put my um, laser pointer on and I can show you. So this is the calibration for the MPAES, and you can see all the different elements across the top. Okay, and then you'll see we have some QC. And then the first set of 10 are actually crude oil samples. Okay, all these samples were sent blind by a third party lab that works with ASTM. So none of the labs knew what samples they were getting. They just knew if they were to be running it on day one. So they had day one, day two, day three, and day four. And they knew which day to run the samples, but they didn't know what the samples were. So these were the first 10 samples, I guess, for this day. 
And you can see this was actually day one since there's a D, D1. This was sample one, D1, and it was crude oil. So they did the 10 samples uh, the crude for the crude oils, and then they did some QC, and then they ran the 10 uh, residual fuel oil samples after that, and then some QC. So again, you can run all these elements for the mix of samples. You don't have to run a separate crude oil method to a separate fuel oil method. This is run in one single method. Okay, so that's very important and good to know. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's just a few results. I just randomly picked um, day three for lab three. I don't even, can, can't even tell you who lab three is uh, right now. But so these are results for uh, vanadium, iron, and nickel. And you can see this is a calibration curve, which is overlaid um, for the calibration of vanadium. So on top, we can see the, the, um, uh, the peak. And then on the bottom, we can see the, the curve. And you can see they, this lab did a really good job. They did uh, four nines in our, our correlation coefficient of four nines. And we have very linear calibration curve. The next one we're looking at is iron. And you can see we also have a very linear calibration curve for this. And we had a correlation coefficient of uh, four nines as well. And then the third element that we'll show is nickel. And you can see that we had also very uh, linear correlation, our calibration curve, and we had a correlation coefficient of, I think, uh, 0.998. So that is great. Okay, so now I just want to show you the method test ranges. So this is the one for crude oil, and you can see the different elements that we're looking at for crude oil. And you can see iron, vanadium, nickel, calcium, sodium, potassium, and sulfur. Okay, and you can see that most of these uh, elements go down quite low. So this is all in milligrams per kilogram. And you can see um, if iron goes down to, has a range from 0.1 all the way up to 208. And all these were calculated based on the ILS of 12 labs by the ASTM statistician. Okay, now you can see the method test range for the residual fuel oil. And you can see we have vanadium, nickel, calcium, sodium, aluminum, silica, zinc, and sulfur. And we have very good ranges for each of these elements. And this is what I wanted to share with you today. And so I think that now we are going to move over to some Q&A with Daniel, myself, and Jan. And thank you for um, your interest in the ASTM D8322 method. Again, I'm very excited that this method has finally been finalized. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing that information with us. There are some questions that have come in from users that have already looked at the D8322 standard. I wonder if you and Jan could share your experience with us to help answer some of these questions. So the first question, from your participation in the MPAS study, what do you think the instrument could be most useful to the lab in terms of ease of use and cost reduction? Thanks, Daniel. That is a really good question. Um, I would say um, probably the ease of use of the MPAES is huge. Um, I was able to go into each of the interlaboratory studies uh, participants that were working on the MPAES method with us, and I had to go in and train the folks how to use the MPAES, and they all learned how to use it really, really quickly. Um, there was only one laboratory that was familiar and had an MPAES in their lab, and this was one of the university labs. But with the exception of that one lab, the other 11 labs had never even seen an MPAES before. Um, there was ICP OES users and ICP MS users, but no one had specifically worked with an MPAES. And I was extremely impressed. Uh, with all the participants being able to pick it up really fast and learning how to use the instrument, understand the instrument, and be able to uh, work with the software. Um, the software is really simple and intuitive, and again, it really impressed me. As far as cost reduction for um, the MPAS, 
not having argon is a huge bonus. I recently visited a lab here that um, has OES, ICP OES systems and ICPMS systems, but multiple units of both. And they spend about $4,000 a week on argon. That's a lot of money for a lab. Um, and even if they were able to move a fraction of their test methods uh, onto an MPAES, that could save a lot of money. Another thing that came up at this laboratory, and I'm sure it's a problem for other laboratories um, around, is that there potentially could be um, times when argon is hard to get. Even laboratories that are in, you know, an urban area, a city where normally argon delivery is not a problem during these crazy times, um, especially this COVID-19 time, you never know. And sometimes you don't get your, your argon delivery as scheduled. And to be able to have some of your crucial test methods, um, having a backup method on an MPAES where argon is not needed, people can see a lot of value in that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that question, Daniel. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great, uh, great feedback about the method. And it's, it's great to share the, the benefits that the MP can provide. So um, thank you for that. Um, Another follow-up question, Jenny. How do you think different labs, like a production or an R&D lab, would find MPAES helpful in different aspects? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think that they would benefit from a lot of the points I just said above. So again, it's really easy to use and very intuitive software. Um, and a lot of the things, like you talked about earlier, the ease of uh, putting the torches in and taking the torches out, and um, making things very simple for people, that's really good. Because some of those labs uh, don't necessarily have the, um, you know, uh, a lot of advanced uh, technicians, we'll say. Uh, maybe they have more entry-level technicians or they have people that are running multiple instruments um, and have to learn kind of like be the jack of all trades and run a GC and LC and MPAES or an ICPOES. And so they might not have the, um, technical knowledge of some of the other IC, ICP, OES, and MS users, but they're able, they would be easily able to be trained on an MP, AES. It's just, it's really that simple. Um, and another uh, advantage for production lab would be that soon we'll probably have two ASTM methods. Uh, we have the ASTM D8322 method, which we talked about today. And soon we'll have another um, ASTM method. Hopefully we have a, another work item. So the methods will already be complete and all they have to do is hit go if they have the template for our methods in the MPA, yes. Yeah, so that really l leads to the, the benefits that I, I talked about with our MP about being easy to use. Um, it's all been designed to be really easy to use. And then we have the added benefit of applet mode, which it really doesn't take mm -hmm. much for an uh, a user to get up and, and running and can be a jack of all trades as simple as loading the method and hitting run. So um, that's yeah. really great, great to hear that we can, we can benefit um, a wide range of users. Uh, so Jan, um, from your experience in the oil and gas industry, is there any other applications that you could see to be used with the MPAES? Yeah, sure. And I think in oil and gas that a lab in a remote location can really find good use of the MPAES, especially that it only runs on air and um, instead of argon. And like Jenny mentioned that argon can sometimes really hard to find, especially in a remote location. So with the MPAES with the nitrogen generator, along with the instrument, then a lab in a remote location can really find good use for that. Um, one example I can think of is some upstream labs, and you know, some uh, upstream, their drilling site is in the middle of nowhere, but they do need to test whatever the product they, they have recovered from the ground, or um, for downstream labs that uh, maybe in the terminal lab, that, for example, that are often in a location that are really hard to get, um, the, the resources are really hard to get to, but the product are really need to be tested before um, they ship out uh, uh, to their customers. 
So lab in remote locations can, can find good use for the MP. Yeah, that actually reminds me um, of one of my trips. So when I used to work at an oil and gas company, I would have to travel to remote locations, you know, where you're taking multiple planes, sometimes a helicopter to get over to these terminal labs. Um, well, I, went, I took a trip once to Nigeria, and again, it was like, like you said, offshore, or well, it was at a terminal. Um, and so we had to take a special flight to get to that terminal. And I was there to do two weeks of ICP OES training. So it was back-to-back -back training one week for one shift and the next week for another shift. And they had such a hard time getting argon for their ICP OES. And I remember we had one tank to do all the training for two weeks. And that really scared me because I never had that um, limitation before being, you know, in California and uh, getting argon is not normally an issue for us here to having to really, um, what's the word I'm looking for, be, be uh, careful with how much argon we were using for each of the different like uh, experiments and learning um, skills that we were doing every day. We would turn the instrument on, warm it up really quickly, do what we were going to do, and then turn it back off again. There was no leaving it on and, you know, mm -hmm. running extra things or like playing with, playing with much. So, um, so that definitely made me think of uh, the example you gave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, yeah, in both situations, it's ideal, you know, and it's a risk that can be run and running in uh, an ICP OES and, and acetylene is the same, you know, you're relying on that, that delivery all the time. So right. by having our nitrogen generator, you don't have to worry about any of that and, you know, you just run it off air. Um, it, it's really, it's really great. So um, that's fantastic to hear that we can actually be beneficial to those guys. <laughs> So yeah. still I wish we would have had an MPAES at that lab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another question for Jan. How about refinery labs and the third party labs that they send their samples to? How do you think the MPAES can be useful to those labs? Yeah, so I think the refinery labs can really find the MPAES to be very useful. Um, as far as I know, refinery labs are really tight in budgets most of the time. So now they, they can save the cost in using argon, like Jenny was mentioned earlier, with $4,000 a week that uh, our MPAES can become very attractive to them. Now, especially our MPAES method is the ASTM method, then it will make the implementation even more attractive. And this goes to uh, the third party lab as well. Um, we find some refineries, they are not equipped to have a full scale lab. So oftentimes they will send their sample out to third party labs for certification or for monitoring of the refinery processes. So now with the um, uh, standard method associated with our MPAES, then the third party lab can really uh, make use of the MPAES um, for their, to reduce their cost and as well as for their ease of operation. That's great. Yeah, um, it, it adds more elements as we've, we've heard from, from Jenny's presentation. Um, so we, we can actually add more capabilities and um, combine some things and make it easier for, for all parties involved, especially those third party labs that are running multiple different methods. Yes, like you said, Daniel, uh, we're able to do more than just iron, nickel, and vanadium, like a lot of um, ASTM crude oil methods do. This method is also able to do calcium, sodium, aluminum, silica, zinc, potassium, and sulfur. So that's a great addition to the, um, to the element list for different laboratories. Yeah, so it's all in one and, and we can do more elements on the one technique and on the one instrument without having to, to cross over into other techniques. Yeah. So some users have also been onto the ASTM website and saw that there's another work item coming up on the MPAES for biodiesel. What's that about? Oh, that's a great question, Daniel. So uh, yes, so we had another um, method running concurrently 
with the ASTM 8322 method, which was the one we just talked about. But we're also working on a biofuels method. And if you give me one second, I can share my screen and show you the work item number, which hopefully this will become a final method very soon. So let me switch over to share my screen with you guys. Okay, so now you should be able to see my screen and you can see that this biofuels method, um, like I said, is a work item right now and it's um, work item 56916 and this is the new test method for determination of metals in biodiesel in organic mode by NPAES. And so this is really exciting. So we've already done the ILS and we are working through the comments of the reviewers right now and so hopefully very soon this will be also a final method at ASTM. Uh, just a little bit of background on this method, if, if you got time. Um, so this started um, from our close work with um, one of the researchers, uh, Teresa Alman at NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And she's on the committee for uh, biofuels. And that committee needed uh, a method that could analyze metals in their um, biofuels. So working with Teresa and the group, um, we were able to come up with this method that meets all their needs. So that was very exciting. And another exciting thing is Teresa and her group at NREL, they've recently uh, published this technical report where they used our NPAES and this method that we developed with them and they've um, published it on their NREL uh, website. So if anybody's interested, they could go check out this uh, technical report where they use this method uh, to look at um, biodiesel blends, so in real life uh, samples. So it was really good, very interesting. I think that's yeah, a that's... very exciting news that um, like all the more renewable research in our MPAES are able to participate in that. Yeah, so the adding elemental analysis to something that traditionally hasn't had it, but also providing an instrument that's really easy to use so traditional users actually can get up and running as fast as possible. Yeah, and I actually went to Teresa's lab to train her on how to use the MPAES and she, this was like a totally new technology for her. I mean, she's an extremely bright um, researcher and, you know, you know, one of the best in her field, but this was all new for her and she caught on, you know, I think I was there for two days and she, she was able to run the instrument and, you know, produce all this data and this technical report. So um, she's definitely a testament to how uh, even a newbie to the atomic spectroscopy world can jump in and use the MPAES to get started and get, get the data that they need. That's great. So thank you, Jenny and Jan, for joining me today. Um, and thank you all for joining our webinar today on the ASTM D8322. Um, for more information about the method or the MPAES, um, feel, free, feel free to contact us, um, myself, Jenny or Jan, um, and our email addresses are there below. Thank you.